So mobile accessibility, super important. Um, it's also really important, winning. <laughs> winning, and winning to me is rolling around on the ground being smothered by puppies, because I'm sort of dog obsessed. So I had this question, how can we combine mobile accessibility and winning? Because it sort of gets left behind, and so if we position it as something that is positive in some way that we can make the experience better, we can actually win at this, and so that's the goal of this talk, is how to win at mobile accessibility. I'm Marcy Sutton, I am a, I'm a developer, but now my title is Accessibility Engineer at Adobe. I'm from Seattle, Washington, um, at Adobe, I work on desktop software that has web components in it to make it more accessible to people with disabilities. And so that's a pretty new role for me. I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, but in the past, I have worked on the Angular framework, uh, working on the actual framework itself, um, including the NG ARIA module for accessibility. Uh, I also wrote the first draft of a plugin for testing accessibility in Protractor. That's a project I'd like to pick up more because I think it sets people up for success. If you can actually test your projects, highlight what's going wrong, um, that's where I want to put a little more energy in Angular, but I now don't work on it full time. So uh, I'm also wearing a sparkly jacket because why not? My slides are on GitHub. I've been evolving this topic for the last few months, so I just keep pushing new versions of the talk. So you can find them at marcysutton.github.io slash mobile-a11y. And if you're wondering what a11y means, it's what's called a numeronym for accessibility, and it's just a shorter hashtag. So today we're gonna talk about barriers that get in the way for people who need to navigate the web for accessibility. What, what's actually getting in their way? We'll look at UI patterns and things that you can actually control um, in a space that's moving rapidly and is sometimes a little painful. Um, the things that you can actually contribute and uh, make your apps more accessible, uh, we'll look at some of those patterns. And then we'll look at the state of mobile web accessibility tooling. Uh, because tooling is a way that you can, just like the protractor stuff I mentioned, it's a way that you can actually highlight problems and then fix them quickly. So there's no question, mobile is growing, it's here to stay. Um, in 2014, the number of people who connect to the internet using only a mobile device surpassed the number of people who connect using desktop. That's huge. It's really significant how many people are using their mobile devices only. And across the world, this is really significant. Uh, recently, there was this article in the New York Times about a 21st century migrant's essentials, including food, shelter, and a smartphone. Smartphone allows people to connect people back home, figure out where you're going. Um, so when I see articles like this and hear about um, people like Sophie Shepherd talking about smartphones for migrants, I think about, oh, well, there's bound to be some people in that large, number, that large population who need accessibility features. In case you need some more convincing, because <laughs> Me being passionate about this uh, is not enough to convince everyone that accessibility is important. Um, it, I've heard estimates that accessibility represents 15 to 20% of the global population. This is a pretty wide statistic. It includes all different kinds of disabilities, including vision, so blindness, low vision. Uh, a lot of people don't, aren't fully blind, but they have low vision, so they might need to zoom the screen or uh, change to high contrast mode. There's people with hearing disabilities, so we need to provide uh, captions and, um, I guess, transcripts for video and audio content. There are people with motor and physical disabilities, and that impacts how they might physically use a device. Um, same thing with desktop sites making the keyboard work. And then there's a, a group of people who have cognitive or learning disabilities. Um, that's a newer space that's a bit harder to, to qualify, um, but it's definitely, um, there's a significant number of people who have cognitive disabilities. If you still need convincing why you should bother with this, why this is important, um, there's a couple different reasons. The first is there's sales potential. You are potentially leaving sales dollars on the floor by not making your apps accessible. This is getting to the business case of accessibility, which is not as glamorous, I will admit. Um, same with the legal risk. 
These are the you know, less glamorous parts of accessibility, but they're meaningful and they're a good way to actually sell this up the chain of command at your company. If you need to convince someone that you need a little more time to work on it, the sales potential and legal risk are big parts of this. The parts that I really latch onto more personally are that there's an innovation opportunity. It's really freaking cool to make something that's well designed and technically awesome that's accessible. It's not, you know, I don't think it's boring at all, actually. There's some really cool challenges here, um, and Angular was a good example of that. And then lastly, it's just the right thing to do. I care a lot about people, I have a lot of friends with disabilities, and so um, it means a lot to me to put out work that my friends can actually see and use. You could also be a little selfish about it and design or develop for future you because maybe you'll end up with a disability or someone in your family will end up with a disability. There's a great uh, thing out from Microsoft called the Inclusive Design Toolkit and it has all of these personas and ways that you can describe accessibility. Um, for example, if you had one arm, that might be a way that would impact how you use the web if you can only use a device in one hand. Um, if you had an arm injury that would take you from all of a sudden you didn't have a disability to you have a temporary disability. Uh, if you were a new parent and one arm is occupied, you're then in a situational disability. So there's all of these examples of ways that maybe you didn't think accessibility applied to you that I bet you you're one degree away or it could affect you in the future. So to, to get some more details about how people use the mobile web for accessibility, and just mobile in general actually, not just the web, uh, we don't have many statistics for accessibility because of privacy concerns. So one thing we do have is the screen reader survey from WebAIM, and WebAIM stands for Web Accessibility in Mind. Every couple of years they put out this survey, they ask people with disabilities to self-report what they use, what platforms, what browsers, what screen readers, and overwhelmingly on mobile, iOS is winning. Um, Android is pretty far behind, but there's kind of these clear two winners in accessibility for mobile. It's unlike normal statistics um, for mobile where Android might be a winner um, or they might be more in contention. Um, but I frame all of my mobile accessibility work with, the, with this data to say I'm gonna focus on iOS and Android because uh, as I will show you a little later, it can be a little daunting because of all the fragmentation. But within the accessibility space, there is a question in the screen reader survey, the last version, it actually didn't reappear in version six, um, but the question was, do you use a mobile screen reader more than a desktop screen reader? A lot of people answered no, and this is a couple years old, so I'd be curious to, I don't know why they didn't bring this question back. But a, a number of people said, yes, they do use a mobile screen reader more than a desktop screen reader. And then a number of people said that they use both, about the same. So if you combine the yeses and the about the sames, that's just under half of the people who reported this saying that they actually use mobile screen readers. And if you didn't know, yes, mobile screen readers are a thing. Some of the features on iOS, which is a fantastic platform for accessibility, include voiceover, the screen reader. Dictation uh, in Siri, if you've ever, you know, used your voice to dictate a text message, I use that all the time. The zooming feature from the operating system level um, can help people with low vision to be able to actually zoom in all the time. Some people might invert colors or use grayscale if they have low vision issues. And then there's this switch control where someone with a motor disability might want Maybe they can't interact with the phone the same way, but they can use a switch control where it limits the amount of movements that you have to use to cycle through a web page. And I'll show you why that's important a little later. <coughs> Similarly on Android, they have another set of accessibility features, and there's a lot of overlap. Uh, these are two great platforms for accessibility. The screen reader on Android is TalkBack. Um, they also have their own version of switch access or switch control. Android supports braille displays, just like iOS does. They also have a high contrast mode and magnification. Like, there are some really fantastic features here. So within mobile apps, you're, you're probably already familiar with this, but there are multiple contexts. There are the native apps where you write Objective-C or the flavor of Java that Android uses to actually create an app that goes into the app store. 
Lately, there's been this push to create hybrid apps where you're using web technologies, but you're still deploying them into a native wrapper that then goes into the app store. So I think a little bit more about the hybrid apps than the native apps, because I'm a web developer by trade. Um, but mobile web is really where I focus a lot of my attention. So today we're going to look mostly at mobile web. But I should say, and when I started, I actually have a blog called Accessibility Wins, and I, when I asked for examples of, of winning accessibility, um, I got back a lot of native app examples. And it, I'm like, great, okay, well, those are awesome, but I'm a web developer, and the audience of this blog is web developers, so we need more mobile web wins. The reason for this is that accessibility is frankly easier to get right on native platforms. There's frameworks that help you. It's sort of like bowling where you have the bumpers at the side of the lanes and they kind of keep you in the middle. Although there are so many um, you know, platform versions, there's so many targets to compile to that I start to question whether it's really that much easier. Um, but the web accessibility piece, I really want to make this better. So by focusing attention on this and not just tossing it aside and saying, ah, native always wins, I really want to make this space better. So that's my driving force behind this talk. I really feel like, come at me, bro, like this penguin squirreling through the tundra, uh, that I, I'm not willing to admit that native is always going to win. I think there's some really smart people that we can put on this problem and make it a lot better. So what are the things getting in people's way? What are the barriers to access for mobile web accessibility and mobile accessibility in general, actually? One real world offline example would be if you were using Uber or a car, car service like that and you had a guide dog and if the driver refused to pick you up because you had a guide dog, that would be a barrier to using their service. Similarly, if their app didn't work for you if you were blind, that would be a barrier to not using their service. Some actual, you know, tangible examples of how this prevents people from using the web on the mobile. Lockdown Zoom, like if you can't actually pinch and zoom because maybe as a developer you have some really painful horizontal scrolling that you can't get rid of, so your solution is to lock down zooming. Been there. Uh, you might hijack scrolling because uh, an art director thought it would be cool. Like we all know these techniques exist, so I'm not going to show you too much detail on those, but they're definitely a problem. The reason why the uh, lockdown zooming is a problem is if text is too small. And my example is from the New York Times mobile site. You've got this style sheet, right? You've got it looking great on desktop and then you scale it down as a responsive site and the text just ends up being so small to try and fit everything into one column or a portion of one column that the text is so small that you can barely read it. Um, there are subscribe and login links, the date, uh, the byline on an article is so tiny that I can barely see it, but they've locked down zooming. So I'd have to go back to the, uh, the mobile device's operating system settings to zoom in. An average user, user, you shouldn't be forcing to go and use the, um, the OS zoom. Like, let people pinch and zoom. It's a really nice feature. Visual clutter is a problem. I have sort of an over-the-top example of a site that's actually not mobile optimized at all. Um, but you kind of get the idea that if there's so much crammed into a small space, there's no visual hierarchy. You don't know where to go. It's, it's overwhelming as a user. Um, and there's a great article in my slides from the Nielsen Norman group on minimizing cognitive load. Because if you're just overwhelmed, um, like your baseline is that you're already sort of overwhelmed when you're looking at the web, that if there's so much crammed into a small space, it makes it really hard to look at anything and to use anything. So that's where the visual clutter starts to become a barrier. Ambiguous visual icons, it, they come up in accessibility, but it sort of transcends accessibility into just usability. Um, if you have icons that make sense to you because you're of a certain demographic or um, of a certain age, like the floppy disk icon for saving, um, I think young people these days Maybe they just see the save icon, but they don't know what that means. If we're just using the icon by itself, if we added a label underneath it so that it said what the purpose of the icon was, it would take any ambiguity away from the icon. It would make it really clear what it was for. A house that looks like a house might mean home here, but to a refugee, I mean, is that still a house? Does that mean home? Where, where does that icon take you? 
what does a hamburger icon even mean if you're not in technology? I have a lot of friends in Seattle who don't necessarily work in technology. I think we have a culture there where tech is very at the forefront of people's minds, but not everyone works in the same industry as us, so they might not know. Um, elderly people might not know what that icon means. And if you have an icon like a bar chart that does some specific thing in your app, but that icon is being used for some other feature in someone else's app, all of a sudden we have no idea what that icon is for. So if you label these icons right underneath, it does two things. It can remove ambiguity. It can also, if the icon doesn't load, you have a label there, it's still usable. Conflicting gestures. I have a video of this to show you exactly uh, what I mean by a conflicting gesture. But my example is from the Ionic framework, which is a, a great framework. Um, I think it needs some accessibility work, um, but it's meant for hybrid apps. You use web technologies to create a native app that you then push the App Store. They have this swiping card demo on their website. Um, I'm gonna just show you how it works. Um, so the first part of this video, I use the swipe interface the way it was intended, and the, the motion is you just drag down. It's just a, like up to down swipe. Then the second part of the video, I'm gonna fire up voiceover so you can hear what, this, what happens in a screen reader. I couldn't actually use it because there's conflicting gestures. Because the screen reader has gesture support, it has its own set of gestures, they conflict with what's happening on the screen. So the first, I'm gonna swipe through these cards. And there's just a kind of an endless stream of cards. Voiceover on, Safari, help out. Heading level one. So now I'm going to drag my what finger What kind of on the clouds screen. are these? Pick four PNG. Image. Answer. Button. Decline. Button. Pick four PNG. P. Papa. I. C. Charlie. Four. Period. P. So there could be an amount of operator error here. <laughs> I could just be doing this wrong. Uh, but if you're blind, how do you figure that out? You are expecting the gesture support in your mobile screen reader because it's a touch interface. You're just kind of exploring around, and so this swipe interface all of a sudden is completely unusable. Also, they forgot alt text in that image. That's why it read the file name. Um, but what, what you could do to make this better, and um, an example of this I heard in the real world was a friend working on a PDF viewer. This is a huge problem for them because they have the swipe interface. So my recommendation to him was to add other buttons. Add some affordances to the UI so that a user can actually navigate still without using the swipe. And if you're in you know, a dedicated app, it's probably worth considering adding other controls for accessibility purposes. Fragmentation. This is gonna be some real talk. I don't want this to scare you. Um, but part of my motivation for this talk is to make the space better. It's really fragmented. My example, or what's on the screen right now, is um, all of the different screen sizes of Android devices. And if you've done any responsive design, you're probably already aware that it can be sort of painful to support all of these platforms. In accessibility on mobile devices, the support for HTML5, so both the, the semantics that are built into HTML5 tags and ARIA, which if you're not familiar, ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And it's an API to allow you to basically add attributes that sort of, they do the work that HTML5 is doing for you, but you can add custom attributes onto your, uh, or add attributes onto your custom elements. For example, you can use ARIA to recreate a list. I wouldn't recommend it, but the mechanism is there to use ARIA in case you can't use the semantic HTML5 for some reason. The support for these is pretty good, but you can't always guarantee that the support on a mobile device will be the same as it is on the desktop, because mobile is frankly just less mature as in the browser space. So there's that, plus any number of assistive technology devices that the user is using on top of the browser, and their user settings if they're zooming. So we sort of have to just relinquish a little bit of control over how a user is going to use our thing because we don't really know how they're gonna be using it. So that makes it a little bit challenging. You can't always guarantee that, you know, pixel perfection or that swipe interface all of a sudden people, the way people are navigating the mobile web is getting in the way of the way we intended them to use it. So how do we get back to winning? And I refreshed my page. Um, 
I don't know why it didn't bump back up, but I have a video of a kid dancing, and I just think this is the best example of winning that I could ever possibly find. He's like wiggling and like has a smile on his face and he's doing this. And I just love this as an example of winning. So how can we deal with the fragmentation but win? We can work on the things we can control, right? You can't exactly control the browser support or the fragmentation. That'll improve over time. But right now what you can do is address some of those barriers um, by using UI patterns that actually work for people. So here's how to win. First thing you need to know is that you're competing with the browser's reader button. And I am a perfectionist when it comes to front-end development. I will slave over something to get it perfect. To know that a user's most used button who's blind is this reader button, they're just gonna bypass everything. They're gonna skip past all of this beautiful fidelity that you've built into the front end and go straight to the reader button because they wanna get right to the content. Because we're jamming so much stuff into these small pages um, that it's frankly easier to get to the content if you hit this reader button. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The next thing, um, and this is a great resource from the BBC, they have this set of mobile accessibility guidelines that's pretty unique. I don't know of any other guidelines for mobile accessibility specifically other than this. What's great about it is they break these guidelines into specific audiences. So for developers, for designers, for content writers, because each of those groups, when you're creating a mobile experience, they all have different concerns. Um, and it'll sort of give, get you closest to having a checklist of things you can go through and actually say, like, how can I make this more accessible? So I highly recommend the BBC's mobile accessibility guidelines. One thing you could do, <laughs> a winning pattern, is to actually use HTML buttons, uh, not just div soup. And yes, you can use ARIA, but a lot of work has gone into creating uh, semantic HTML elements that have accessibility built in, and the support for those is way better. Um, and I, my example is CNN. Their hamburger button, which I mentioned earlier, would benefit from text under it, because um, they're such a global site that um, you're sort of just guessing, what does this button do? Um, but they use a div. It's a generic element. It do, it's not discoverable by a screen reader. It also has zero text in it. So as far as a screen reader user knows, this is just an empty div, and it do, there's no way to even know that it's there. So if you use um, buttons and other semantic HTML elements, you get a lot for free. Trust me, it's worth it. So to fix the CNN example, and I just sort of hacked at this in the dev tools, um, I changed the div to a button element. That means that then a screen, reader who, a screen reader user who is navigating around a touch device, when they get to this thing on the screen, um, the, it'll announce it as button. And then I went one step further to actually label this thing uh, to add the aria-label attribute. This is a great attribute. It's pretty well supported. You can just put some text in there. It will label this icon button, so then a screen reader will announce what that particular button is for. And in my slides, I have an article by Hayden Pickering on using ARIA label. Uh, it's a really great resource. Um, and this is probably the biggest, or like the easiest win in mobile accessibility would be to actually label things. And this is true for native apps and hybrid apps too. Often, apps are just missing labels. So that's one easy thing that you could really do to get my stamp of approval. Touch targets. So. We all have fat fingers. Uh, sometimes after a pint, it's a little hard to you know, navigate the screen. Um, my example is from Creative Block, and ironically, they have an article called The Top 10 Mobile Design Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. And because uh, we're in the EU, um, they have a cookie warning that pops up. Actually, there are two cookie warnings, which is an unfortunate bug that I have immortalized in the screenshot <laughs> and in video now. <laughs> um, but there is an action button in this little cookie warning with an X. And without voiceover turned on, you see there's a white box in the corner and it has an X in it. You would think psychologically looking at the box that the button is the entire white space. But when I fire up mobile voiceover and it actually outlines the target, it's just the width of the X. That's not very big for human fingers. Um, so for touch devices, if you added a little more padding, even if it just went the width of the white box, that would be an improvement. To take it one step further, you could do what Simply Accessible does. They have a beautiful responsive mobile site um, that their menu button goes all the way across the whole page. 
it takes the full width of the mobile browser, which it makes it really easy to hit. Um, and it looks a different color because I have it highlighted with mobile voiceover. But normally it's just seamless and it blends into their header. But for somebody, I mean, even just to be able to tap that icon, you don't have to be like, directly on it. You can open their menu really easily. It makes usability way better. So add generous padding to things for touch devices. Crafting mobile tab order. So I'm gonna pick on huge a little bit, but this isn't unique to them. I have two examples of this. The first one, I'm gonna show you the problem. Then I'm gonna show you the problem again. We're gonna look at how to fix it and we'll re-emerge and more informed about this sort of tricky problem that I've discovered in mobile web accessibility. So I'm gonna play a video um, where I'm navigating the huge website on my iPhone. I just recorded this yesterday sitting in a cafe. Um, so their interface has multiple screens and if you swipe through them, it's actually an example of uh, scroll jacking, which is not my favorite thing ever, but it, they had a very intention, intentional reason to use it, and it's that each screen locks into place. Um, so I'm gonna show you what happens when I navigate those screens just normally, and then I'm gonna fire up voiceover, and you'll hear what the experience is. So I'm navigating the next screen, so you can see that there's multiple panels. And before I go further, I wanna to describe to you how I'm navigating this. Um, so there is an, uh, a way of navigating mobile sites. So you can just drag your finger around. You can also go through the entire tab order. So similar to if you're using a keyboard and you hit tab and you go through the whole tab order, on a mobile site, we have that same affordance, actually. Um, you just swipe left or right and you can go through every link in a mobile site. So that's what I'm gonna show you on the huge site. Voice over on, Safari, heads up, heading level two, link. So swipe right. Heads up, heading level two, link, region. Huge launches a grassroots campaign in partnership with the White House, link. Right arrow, link, end. Movable type, heading level two, link. A major mobile makeover for a statio, Where's that link. content? Right arrow, You'll link, see it. end. Gucci, heading level two, link. Region, Gucci's new mobile experience increases conversion. Link, right arrow, link, and region. So all of a sudden, when I use this mobile, uh, the mobile screen reader to navigate through the page content, I'm cycling through content that's visually hidden. Uh, that's super confusing, um, and that's definitely not what they intended visually. So visually, the panels that you're not seeing are supposed to be hidden. Um, but because the screen reader gives the user control to navigate through all the links, all the headings, all of this stuff that a screen reader is really good at, um, the content that's visually hidden has not actually been hidden. So let, we're, we're gonna look at how to fix that. I'm also gonna show you one more example of this, and this is actually how I found this interface for navigating through the tab order on mobile. Um, I've been working on Angular, as I mentioned, a big part of that engagement was working on the Angular Material UI framework. And Angular Material gives you a set of material design components like dialogues, uh, checkboxes, and all of these things that are like need to be accessible. So the dialogue, the idea with the dialogue, and I get that this isn't the best pattern for mobile, but this is a responsive design framework. And so any component that you make in a responsive design framework that's supposed to be accessible, voila, this is how we arrive here. So what I'm gonna show you is the same way of navigating through the web page using that swipe interface. I'm gonna open a dialog and we'll see the idea with the dialog, as you know, or hopefully you've experienced this with a native dialog on your operating system, is that it opens and you're not supposed to be able to navigate behind it because that would be confusing. Um, turns out that I hadn't properly hidden everything behind it, so let's see what that looks like. Basic usage, heading view source, Button, edit on code pen. Open a dialog over the app's content. Basic usage. View source. And I slipped a little. Alert, button. Alert. Alert, button. Alert, got, this is an alert title. Heading, you can specify some description text in here. Got IT, button. That's voiceover helping. You can specify some description text. This is an alert title. He main, custom, confirm, but alert. Button, open a dialog over the app, edit on code. 
<laughs> so what happened there was the uh, dialog open, focus was sent into it correctly, that tells a screen reader user that there is new content there. But then when I start swiping through the page, just like I did with huge, we end up behind the modal dialog, and that's not what's supposed to happen. So how do we fix that? There's a couple different techniques for this. And the first technique to actually hide content from a screen reader, and this is like accessibility, interactivity 101, um, but in case you didn't already know, if you add display none in CSS, that will properly hide something from a screen reader. But there's two issues with this, and this is a totally valid technique that you should use. However, um, it's not animatable, so if you hit display none in the middle of an animation, poof, everything goes. Also, the dialogue had content that was visible behind it. We didn't wanna just hide everything, we just want a backdrop to cover it, sort of. So you still see it there, but we need to hide it from the screen reader. So display none wouldn't work for that, even though it works for many other things. So the technique that I used for this uh, was to actually disable buttons behind the dialogue. And because it's Angular and it's UI framework, this is a little more complicated than it would be for you. The basic things that you need for this, um, you can use the aria-hidden attribute, which I mentioned aria earlier. What this does is it just hides something from a screen reader. Um, it will pull it out of what's called the accessibility tree so that a screen reader isn't exposed to it. Um, however, there is one, this is a, these two things need to go together. Inside of um, an, a region with aria hidden, which you could put on a parent element and then it will affect a whole region, um, any buttons or links or form controls that are inside of that, uh, we have to actually pull out of the tab order. That screen reader interface I was showing you when we swipe, it was landing on links and buttons. And so to actually remove those, um, we need to put tab index of negative one. So that will properly hide it. And in Angular, this was a little tricky because we allow you to insert it in any place. Um, I'm gonna skip that for time purposes. But let's see what it looks Source. like when it's Button. fixed. Edit on code pen. But open a dialog over the app's content. Prep alert. Button. Alert. This is an alert title. Heading left. You can specify some description text in here. Got IT. Button. All right, we're at the end of the tab order. We're gonna go backwards. You can specify some dis you can specify some this is an alert title. All right. We're in business. This you got you can specify got <laughs> So what I did was I hid everything that was behind it with aria hidden, but then each link that's back there, I had to put tab index of negative one. So what, what, the reason I showed you both of those was to say that the tab index goes on the actual interactive item, like a link or a button, and then aria hidden will also hide it from a screen reader completely. So quickly, um, let's run through the state of tooling and where we're at with testing for mobile accessibility because if you are new to it, you shouldn't have to get that in the weeds with accessibility, like that's my job. Ooh, that's my job and the job of people like Alice Boxhall at Google to actually um, make this easier for you. So what we have versus what we want. We have pretty good desktop browser testing tools for accessibility. You can use the Chrome accessibility developer tools or uh, the Axe toolbar um, to actually test it in a desktop browser. But on a mobile browser, like testing it on the actual device, that's the part that I'm working on. Um, we don't, however, have anything that actually runs a screen reader and tests against that. So that would be where we'd want to get eventually. It's important to note that sometimes the ARIA support on desktop versus mobile can differ, and that's why we actually need to test it on the mobile device itself. So because iOS is the most popular platform for accessibility, uh, I've focused a lot of my attention on iOS Safari and trying to get solutions that actually test that browser specifically. And in Safari, there is a, an accessibility node inspector where if you tether your device using Safari on your Mac, um, you can then go and inspect what's going on in iOS Safari. What we really want, because that means you're going through and like poking at the source code, what you really want is an audit. So it will run a set of uh, like rules against your app and then float up, hey, you forgot a label. Hey, you did this wrong. Because that gives you sort of a checklist to work against. So there's actually an item in the WebKit bug tracker to add an accessibility audit in Safari. Like this is a huge deal and something that they really need to add. Um, if not me working on it, like somebody needs to do this. Apples, get on it. Um, and I know this has been in their, on their radar for a while. 
Um, and it's really important because of how many people have an iPhone. Um, so if we can actually check against mobile Safari, this would be a great tool for that. One thing that we do have um, in the Firefox developer tools, there's an extension called Axe. And if you're wanting to get into accessibility and looking for a good tool, I would highly recommend getting the Axe extension. Um, it doesn't really check a mobile device, though. You can use the device emulator and you know, scale your device or your browser window down to a mobile screen size, so maybe you're checking you know, basic responsive design things like, at this breakpoint, is content really hidden? Um, but it's not actually checking it on the mobile device. So that gets me closer to knowing what tools we need. So to, to actually test or, or to actually debug a, a tethered mobile device in Firefox, um, and this is mainly for Android, which Firefox is a very popular browser on Android, um, you can tether using USB and your device in the Firefox Web IDE tool. What we really want is to get the Axe extension in Web IDE. So this is what I'm working with Mozilla to try and get, figure out, A, why doesn't this work right now? And B, how, how much closer can we get to this? So this is what we want. Something like in Web IDE, get the extension, run, run a set of tests. This is like really going to make your job much easier. So what we do have, um, that's Safari and Firefox. Chrome for Android has OK support. Um, you can tether an Android device with Chrome. There is Chrome on iOS, but it's actually a WebKit um, rendering engine still. So if you're on an Android device using Chrome and you tether it, you can do this thing where you actually inspect the mobile device. And so th I'm showing you this as an example of what your workflow would look like if we had these tools. So if I inspect it using Chrome Inspect, turns out you can run the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools against a tethered Android device. This is what we want. This is awesome. Like This is running against the actual mobile device. It's giving us a set of audits, like your color contrast is whack, or you're using positive tab index. Things that like this tool could point out for you in case you aren't already familiar. It's a really great way to get into developing for accessibility. The only problem with this is that Chrome is not really used for accessibility. But this is a good example of where we want to get. So let's recap. Accessibility is important. Uh, you know, there's sales dollars potentially being left out, out there that you could be claiming. Um, there's the legal risk. I don't talk about that much, but that is a big motivator. Um, there's an innovation opportunity, and it's the right thing to do. We need more mobile testing tools so that it's less painful when it is fragmented. We can actually test it against the device. Uh, use semantics, use buttons and other HTML5 elements because they get you a lot for free. Um, they make your job a lot easier without having to get in the weeds with ARIA. Optimize for humans, both for fat fingers with the touch target size and for icons that people might not know what they mean. Craft your source and your tab order. I think we got closer with knowing what our source order was when in responsive designs we go from three columns down to one. You know, the most important content needs to come first. But we also need to know when our content needs to actually be hidden when it's off screen. Um, so the huge example in the Angular Material Dialog were good examples of managing the tab order on a mobile device. And we just got to keep pushing on this. Um, I am confident that a year from now this could be way better and then mobile accessibility as a result will be better. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, that was, that was...